everyone, and thank you for dining at This Week in Guns, brought to you by Patriot Batch Company, VZ Grips, and made corporation and FFL payments. This show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Matthew LaRosier, and who's my guest? Is it my rat friend? It's me. It's you. <laughs> I have the Glock 17 in caliber 45 GAP, and I'm here holding down the fort on Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon 2. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that game. <laughs> I played it on Dreamcast. And I remember being so frustrated because I had played Medal of Honor, right? And I loved Medal of Honor because I got to stare at, you know, three polygons of BAR and Sten gun. <laughs> and then I hated Ghost Recon too because I couldn't see the gun I was using. Right? <laughs> you had so many guns, but but you couldn't see them. Did you ever play that one? Did you play that? Are you old enough to have actually played that? No, not, not in its prime. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. Like I think I, I I remember having played it, but don't remember anything particular about it. Like played it one time, one night at a friend's. Right. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it's not fun either. <laughs> I didn't remember having much fun. <laughs> no, it certainly. It was um, it was the mind. one where he's like, "Oh, we can stop playing Star Wars Battlefront Two and play this one instead." And we played the other one, and I'm like. You really like this, huh? He pulls out a dusty <laughs> PS1 CD, I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, boy, that's good. Uh, so remember a few months ago, back in September, actually, I think we talked about Biden's dog, Commander. And at that point, his bite count was up to like 10 or 12. <laughs> yep. Well, things have gotten a little different. Uh, I'm starting to feel like Commander... Um, you might be our guy. <laughs> so but here's the headline. Biden's dog commander has bit Secret Service personnel in at least 24 incidents now. <laughs> I threatened to bite a Secret Service guy and I get a visit. <laughs> <laughs> this dog just gets a vacation every time it does it. Well, he even doesn't get that. Commander Biden, President Joe Biden's family dog, bit U.S. Secret Service personnel in at least 24 incidents at the White House and other locations according to new internal U.S. Secret Service documents obtained by CNN. Uh, yeah, USSS. I think that's a great acronym for a, a government. <laughs> um, that number does not include additional incidents CNN previously reported involving executive resident staff and other White House workers being bit. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, the recent dog bites have challenged us to adjust our operational tactics when Commander is present. <laughs> give lots of room. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Agents must be creative to ensure our own personal safety. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is an undated photo of Tain Throw a FOIA request throwing a USSS agent's torn shirt following That's, a bite. bite for, for the audio listeners, it's not it's not like, oh, the dog like nipped at somebody and, and they said bad dog. It's like tearing up people's clothes. Like it's really biting people. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah no. Uh, in October 2022, an unnamed SS technician described an incident and said they were worried about the family pet's behavior escalating and that something worse was going to happen to others. Oh, what a good dog. So yeah, he's actually got two dogs. The other one's called Major, and apparently that one's like doesn't go around biting people. Yeah, you should oh. take after the one that bites government agents. Yeah, so which is the good boy? That's the question. Answer down in the, the cope section, which dog is good boy? Would you bite a Secret Service agent, and where would you bite him? <laughs> and, and would you chew? <laughs> would you let go whenever they said, bad dog, stop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. All right, next up, you know what else I like to bite? Mm, I want to get me a, a good old chunk of that VZGrips.com. It's chewing that tactical slant, guys. VZ Grips, use code this week 15 that's T H I S W E E K 1 5, because they, for whatever reason, continue to support us. Uh, <laughs> and so we, but we do unironically love their grips. They are just really good. Um, that's true. But yeah, so be sure to go to VZGrips.com, use promotional code this week 15, and then in the order doobly do, you got to write down, do the Draco grip, and uh, I don't know, write something offensive vaguely. Uh, so Threatening. <laughs> Threatening and about Draco grips. <laughs> Yeah, that's big. Uh, next up, this is an interesting one. So this is uh, Giffords Group, 
which I believe, I think they're in the lawn care business. Yes. Uh, they are like touting one of the weirdest victories ever. Uh, so this has to do with the lawsuit that they want done and did a while back. Uh, and this was when the, basically the government was reeling back its uh, ghost gun ban. This, I, so the, the lawsuit dates back even before that. Yeah. So they, they first filed this lawsuit before the frame or receiver rule was a thing. And essentially what they were trying to do was strong arm the ATF into Doing saying it. that 80% were illegal. Mm -hmm. And then the ATF was like, no, because you know, because at first their position was, yeah, but our longstanding tradition and this is what the law says and we can't change it. Right. Then, then they dropped the rule. And so they stay the lawsuit because it's like, okay, at least the initial draft of the rule gave Giffords everything they wanted, right? Because the initial draft right. of the rule would have banned pistol slides and potentially AR uppers, at least at the very least, not if not just AR bolts. Yeah. So it was like, <laughs> it was a weird clusterfuck of a rule. Yeah, it was and, funny. And once ATF amended it to make it make sense, Giffords in California were back in court going like, yo, what the fuck? <laughs> Why did you take it away? It was back and, right. and the, you know, the ATF then did a series of three letters. Uh, you know, the first one was very general. The second one applied just to ARs. The third one applied just to Glock-based stuff that oh. essentially said, this is what a compliant frame, un this is what a compliant unfinished frame or receiver would look like. These are the things that you couldn't sell it with in one box. Like you couldn't, you, you could do an 80% AR lower. You could also sell jigs. You cannot sell them together because, yeah. you know, th then it becomes a firearm. Don't, don't write down where the holes are. And also don't include instructions when you sell a product. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no instructions can come with it either. But uh, Giffords in California then sort of, reactivated their lawsuit to hone right. in on those letters the ATF wrote that essentially said this isn't a frame or receiver. Right. We're not considering this a frame or receiver because you know their argument was essentially something along the lines of ATF in their rules said that if it can be readily converted and if there's jigs available for it that they would err on the side of this right. is a firearm and it's not just an unfinished frame or receiver. But then they put out these letters that said they aren't considered firearms right and so the judge it's a 40 page long opinion which is yeah. which is kind of bizarre considering this ju this judge really didn't have much to say right. there was a whole a whole lot of uh like anti-gun activism disguised as legal argument where it's yeah, like, oh, no, there's like there's, and the funny thing is, is we're kind of like avoiding the apa question here which is is there enough hook in the statute to justify what you're doing and yet right. the district court here is spending so much ink. Like they dance around the APA question like crazy. Yeah. Cause because what this comes down to is it, it's a it's a judge who you know, gave way too much leeway to an anti-gun argument because they liked the way it sounded. Right. Because you know, it, unless you address the constitutionality of the APA determination in general, you really can't you really can't get to what the ATF's done here, right? What the ATF's done here is meant to be under the current legal theory right and under the legal theory that the supreme court has said is still binding even in the case you know the vanderstock case that's trying to get rid of the frame or receiver rule so the one right. by our side ostensibly uh the supreme court has said i uh, know the 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 atf has the latitude to make this decision and we are the ones who would get to reverse it and then right. this district court is like oh we're going to dance around the fact that the apa says the atf gets to do this and they like you know, if the atf says it's not a frame or receiver the they're the ones who get the latitude to decide that. That's right. that's. I mean, you know, Chevron deference. We normally look at going the opposite direction, but if they say something is a firearm, they're supposed to be able to do that. If they say something isn't a firearm, they're supposed to be able to do that. And it's only whenever they go completely off the rails that there's supposed to be brakes that can be pumped. There hasn't been, so far as I'm aware, cases where the brakes have been pumped going this direction, like no. ever for the ATF so far. So it's a, uh, it's certainly one of these cases like this judge probably shouldn't have done what they did, but you know, they, they essentially granted Gifford's argument that because you and can like buy ATF saying, Oh, well you can sell these things separately. Uh, and they, and this is actually a fun little, uh, little error that the judge put in here because judges, by the way, and, uh, I might seem like I'm being like petty and pedantic by pointing out a grammatical error. District court judges love making fun of your grammatical errors. Like, the, it, it's this little thing they do to lord over you. And then here, in the conclusion, the very end of the document... <laughs> the only part anybody reads. Yeah. However, the court agrees with plaintiffs that the ATF's action related to example four are arbitrary in capricious. 
the arbitrariness is inside the capricious? No, it's arbitrary and capricious. They must have done doing text to speech or something. But... <laughs> Shout, yeah, arbitrary and capricious in failing to take into account all eight factors related to the readily assessment in particular times, which, by the way, the readily assessment does not exist in statutes. Right. The, the, the readily assessment is, you know, again, invented by the ATF. And I, I don't even know that it's in rule i thought i thought the whole eight hour thing was just them saying in past court cases judges agreed eight hours yeah. in a fully equipped machine shop is reasonable for making machine guns right which even still like <laughs> that's shocking because everything's a machine gun now and this is something that the fifth circuit case dealing with the frame or receiver rule specifically pointed out is guess what eight hours makes everything a machine gun eight hours makes everything a firearm because a yeah. fully equipped machine shop especially modern day you don't even really have to know much about making stuff you can be you can be a little bit of a ninny in a fully equipped machine shop and make a machine gun in eight hours it's not it's not that hard <laughs> and so yeah and so it it sort of comes down to like the fifth circuit really already answered these questions and, and you know, at, at the circuit level the fifth circuit was like yeah, no, this, this and they specifically said this definition of readily is, is junk. It's no good. The eight hours right. thing the, go the, away. The piece of language that I love from the Fifth Circuit that just smashes this like right on its face is that this argument is without any objective hook in statute. And it's so true. Yep. You cannot find, there is no latch for which, you know, there is no garden to plant this seed. It's just not there. Um, but so, yeah, so this, and this is procedurally fascinating, right? They spend a lot of time, the district court judge, in saying like, well, uh, you know, vacating the rule is like, you know, uh, it's what I'm supposed to do, but I don't want to do that to like suggest that the rule is bad. So <laughs> it specifically vacates one subsection of the rule and, and related agency actions, which is again, procedurally bizarre, and remands it to the ATF for further proceeding. What? Consistent with this court's opinion. <laughs> Yo, like, have you separation of powers? You don't, like, that is literally, the district court is, like, acting like an appellate court where the ATF was itself. Right. So it's like, all right, lower court ATF. Do it again the way I like this time. <laughs> and I mean, you know, Chevron is still good law. <laughs> it hurts to say this. Chevron is still good law. A district court doesn't get to tell the ATF they can't do this. That's the, that's the whole reason Chevron exists is the ATF supposed to be able to say, we're the experts. We did it right. So it's a, it's, it's sort yeah, of a funny case. Exactly to say. And now, of course, Giffords trotted this out is like a, is an epic win, right? Like they've they've totally epic owned the the, yeah. the gun rights group known as the ATF. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, get, get we'll, we'll, stepped on, <laughs> ATF gun nerds. We'll have to see what this actually. So, so another thing that Giffords in, in the state of California were trying to argue here is that. AR 80% lowers couldn't have the takedown pinholes complete and all yeah. of the rear pocket, including where the, the takedown pin lug goes, right. couldn't be milled out at all. So you know, they're trying to make it so it's like 70% or something lower. Right. And, and so, so and yeah, so there's a lot of ink spilled here. And the court, to that one only one point, the court's like, Giffords, you're being stupid. Yes. So <laughs> it 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 seems like the Judge is going to ask the ATF now to update their letter and have their letter say, like, if it sold at the same place that sells a jig or something. So we're, we're going to go back to that same position that there was an injunction against where yeah. the a, where the ATF is, like, selling you a fourth dimensional firearm. We're like, <laughs> if, the same, if the same company sells you in two separate transactions at two separate points in time, yeah. an unfinished receiver and then a jig for it. One month prior, you had a firearm because it's not the jig that's the firearm. Yeah. It's not the combination of the two that's the firearm. It's now the yeah. unfinished frame receiver that's the firearm. And you right. also get yourself into trouble with the fourth dimensional thing where like if you had a conveniently shaped block of aluminum that really wasn't a gun part at all, but then at some point in the future, somebody figured out how to make this common stock size of aluminum into a machine gun part or something, you'd be <laughs> hosed. Right? You have a fourth dimensional machine gun all the way back to the beginning of whenever that right. was now 
designed and intended. And so, so of course, it's completely non-workable and specifically not the way the law is supposed to work. And so that's why it was thrown out. And so now this judge in California is like, I haven't thought about this at all. We should make it that way, as if this hasn't already been played out. Yeah. And so the funniest thing about this, right? Giffords is saying, oh, this is a big epic win because we've stopped yeah, potentially poten we stopped potentially nothing. Oh, and you know, Vanderstock is before the Supreme Court. Or I guess it's not before the Supreme Court. The government has filed you know, the government through the Solicitor General has asked the Supreme Court to hear the frame or receiver rule. So it's almost it's almost guaranteed going to happen at this point. Right. But uh Gifford says that this little thing here is a big win, and uh, California, who Giffords is on the same side as in this, has already filed an appeal. <laughs> we we won massively. We're going to appeal. <laughs> We're not happy with our win. On the, on the on the drill pocket issue, I'm assuming so yeah. that that the you know the, the, I imagine what they want is a court that will tell them just having an unfinished frame or receiver like 80 percent yeah. like if it says 80 percent or it's marketed that way we can we can say no which is which is kind of silly and probably copium at this point and and frankly right if if judicial misconduct wasn't the way that <laughs> the court system works uh this case should have been stayed pending the outcome of of Vanderstock anyway right but they're not going to do that. <laughs> they're not going to do that. They're instead they're going to like cram out this decision that's like, uh, yeah, the APA exists. Yeah, Chevron's good law. But we're going to pretend that we don't have to pay attention to that. Yeah. But what if instead? No. <laughs> but yeah. No. So that's. I mean, that's that's all hilarious. But yeah, that's. It's just weird. Um, let's move on here. Let's go on more to our Hawaii Aloha. Uh, Kudasai friends, right? Hawaii, Kauai, right? That's what they say. Yeah. So, as Hawaii is like losing in uh, in their like vampire rule carry stuff, where they're saying that you can't carry a gun into somewhere unless you've been invited in, um, what they're doing now is the rational thing and passing more laws. So the big problem in Hawaii is that they, you know, ban assault pistols, but they were the only ones to not ban assault rifles and assault shotguns. And so they've, they're going to sort that out. Uh, yeah, this Senate Bill 3196 would add assault rifles, assault shotguns, and detachable mags with over 10 round capacities to the list of banned weapons. That's and uh, this is good. Gun control advocates say a possible legal challenge shouldn't stop lawmakers from passing SB 3196. Uh, at, what, at what point does your reasonable doubt of the constitutionality of a law override your how badly you want it? Like, if, if, some, if somebody in one of the good old states was like, yeah, but it was kind of cool having slavery, right? No, I mean, it was, it was kind of cool, wasn't it? Like, <laughs> should, should, there, should there doubts about but when we had it, they said we couldn't do it anymore. They said to stop. <laughs> they said we had to stop. <laughs> like, so here we have um, the, the reasoning. I think that bill fills most of the really glaring problems we have, in my opinion. There's things like requiring insurance for negligent damage done by weaponry that would be useful. There's more <laughs> violence prevention programs that would work. But I think that bill will take us pretty close to as far as we're allowed to go under the federal interpretation of the Constitution. Okay. As opposed to the state interpretation of the federal Constitution. Okay, one of my favorite parts is this, uh, this quote. This is a line drawing bill. At what point on the spectrum of kitchen knife and nuclear weapons, where on that range do we as private citizens get to keep weaponry? I think this bill draws it in a perfectly rational place. Uh, um, it's not weapons, and I think that's part of the <laughs> they can be used as weapons, but like you're like you're making fundamental category errors that are that like this shows why you can't really grapple with the the, the core issues here. Uh, yeah, Alan Beck, who is a, a good friend, is a great guy. Uh, he does a lot of litigation in Hawaii, says that this bill goes further than any other state. They're going to ban virtually all semi-automatic firearms. The issue is being heavily litigated. I think the state is opening itself to a whole lot of unnecessary litigation. 
Uh, what Beck is being silly about here is that the government doesn't have a litigation budget. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't matter. I don't know. I'm I'm not surprised. Um, this, this is another one. Uh, a Honolulu resident, Chris Marvin, an advisory council member of every town, uh, says the legislators shouldn't worry about whether laws they pass could survive future legal challenges. There's never been an assault weapons ban that's been found unconstitutional. It's just a typical gun lobby tactic to stand up and scare legislatures by saying, you better not do this because the Supreme Court might overturn it. <laughs> what a just like fascinating and sideways way of understanding civil rights that we have now. Yes. Uh, well, I guess it's not too different from how it always was. It's just a little <laughs> bit more open. <laughs> you might be violating some people's rights. Who cares? <laughs> well, who, who, gonna, cares? Who, who gonna whoop me? Me, a state legislator? Who gonna whoop me? <laughs> what are you gonna do? Sue me a little bit? <laughs> the... Yeah. I guess the, the more of these stories we cover, right? And I think we may even have another one this show. The the more it seems very necessary to me, and I don't think we've had any movement on this on the like the four or five cases that are an emergency posture to the Supreme Court about hardware bans at this point. I don't think anything's changed since last show, but those cases are still there. And I think the you know, the underlying issue is. I think this case is really, really ripe for review by the Supreme Court at this point. You know, like you, know, at this point, it's going to be close to fifteen, twenty percent of the states are going to have some manner of hardware ban, right? And and just facially, right? It's not, it's not consistent. It can't can't withstand Bruin. I I think even if you applied some sort of interest balancing test, but you did it honestly, I don't think there's a world in which you can say. Rifles and long guns can be banned, but handguns can't. Because right. whenever you go and do that interest balancing, handguns are used to murder people far more frequently. And right. it's you know the, the prevalence of long guns in mass shootings is you know a, a statistical anomaly already. But even even if you want to like oh like God, cookie, even anomaly. if you want to cookie cutter it down to like the ones where there's twenty different people, if you right. stop and look at those you know at those instances, had a handgun been used, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have you know functionally changed the outcome. I love how many so people, like, like the, the thing is the politics of mass shootings are such an integral part of the gun debate now, where people have just completely forgotten, one, the intense rarity of the events at all, and two, like, they just accept as a fact, right, without any argument that a, you know, assault rifle or what have you will significantly impact the shooter's lethality it, it, it's a point that's be, like beyond reproach even among uh like right of center in circles they they kind of don't even want to engage with it all, on all fours of course probably in large part because of the fact that the vast and sweeping majority of people even in the 2a space are completely ballistically ignorant but uh it I don't know. I do feel like that's something that we should have more like serious um, analysis on. Uh, analysis, which I worked on for a time, by the way. Uh, but it, it's a huge hole, right? Because we can say these things and we know we're right. Because we've seen data that, that tells us they're right. But nobody really wants to sit on all fours and engage with it and produce the white paper that you can point to, right? Uh, and those that do, I'm thinking of a couple acts, right, that have put out papers that purport to say this, are even more pseudoscientific and bullshit than, than like, you know, when the, the trauma surgeons say that the AR-15 is, a, um, you know, Right, completely deletes the it's like a grenade going off in the <laughs> bottom. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, and, I you know, certainly there's there's a truth that has to be grappled with in the middle where, like you know, the, and I think the pro gun side has done a bad job of this in the past, and I think they're getting better with it at least. That 
they, you know, they want to make the AR-15 out to be in, in similar weapons, out to be like harmless hunting rifles. They're, God, it's the fucking modern sporting rifle thing. Where it's like, oh, this is this is just a regular sporting hunt gun for shoot a target. And they'll sell, they'll sell some, some version of a story where it's either designed to wound, it's designed to be inaccurate, it's, it's not suitable for shooting at people because it's a small little bullet, and actually a 308 is a real bullet. Like you know, all the while ignoring that it's it's you know, and in fact, it's a factor of ten more powerful than any sort of handgun you might be using. It's it's a it's a significantly more useful weapon, significantly more deadly weapon, significantly easier to use weapon, and I think all of these facts should be embraced and rolled up into. Doesn't that make it perfect for self defense? Yeah. Because you know, it, not, not that I'm going to say that the only reason a firearm should be protected is self-defense, but you've got a Supreme Court that in Heller telegraphs, like they, they almost gave you a rubber stamp that said handguns aren't, you know, especially in the home, a handgun in the home is not the most lucid choice for self-defense. But they said because people chose it and because it's useful, I mean, it's, it's possible to use a handgun for self-defense in the home. They said, yes, you can. And I think I think you really can stick a finger in that open wound and sort of dig around a little bit because you've, I, I think you've got the room to, you know, instead of this, and legal arguments to this extent have really died off after Bruin. And right. I've had it explained to me that the reason they were so popular is that under interest balancing, I guess some, you know, some litigants in the Ninth Circuit felt that like they could convince an anti gun judge that, like, Oh, it's just a sport hunt rifle, and it couldn't even hurt a fly. It's it's it wouldn't hurt. Wouldn't it's just a, just a it's just like a twenty two, and they would do this song and dance, and the judge would be like, "No, I'm not not a fucking idiot." And I think the judge is right because it's yeah. it's it, it is more powerful than a handgun, and it's not just a twenty two. Yeah, and we and, do all know what the most lucid choice for home defense is. Draco, of course. Yeah, it goes without. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. But, but I think. I think hopefully you could because because you might my fear ends up being that if the supreme court ended up answering the hardware ban assault weapons ban question along the lines of well if it's a sporty hunty gun then you can have it but if it's more like a military gun you can't have it if that's how the decision came down you can kiss your dreams of nfa is gone like completely goodbye it will never happen because if you look at what the military uses these days it's short barreled shotguns and short barreled rifles and machine guns and Destructive well, devices. Down to, like so, and here's the thing: people, like the whole barrel length question is, is such a bizarre historical anomaly. Uh, the reason that we had longer barrels, predominantly, you know, around the time of the NFA, was because smokeless was a relatively new invention, and prior to that, <laughs> and they were still worried about cavalry and having to use a bayonet to stop a horse. Yeah, and like literally, and so, and, and so, like, that's where military technology was, and so, l like, legal understanding was decades behind that, and so, people who are w wanting a rifle, or if I, even handguns, wanted the bigger ones, because common understanding was if you want to have a respectable amount of power you need a substantial barrel length that was why <laughs> like it was so uncommon to see shorter weapons um and in fact why shorter weapons were considered um you know suspicious right they're for gangsters or people trying to hide the moment though the moment we figured out that hey uh with this cool new powder that the french came up with you can like make it way shorter <laughs> right your, your 28 inch long rifle can be a 20 inch barrel and you're losing like maybe 20 feet per second you're losing nothing yeah immediately that's what they were doing and and you know it's like stuff like the trappers were like people loved that crap and, and like that was the cutting edge right it was making it shorter but because it was the cutting edge it was you know outside of the the common understanding and so now we're now we've reached the full extent of that where we've designed powders specifically and cartridges even yeah. around the shorter setups yeah exactly like um you know 545 versus 556 these are cartridges that are very ballistically similar out at, at you know meaningful distances but 545 behaves a lot better out of an eight inch barrel than an eight than 556 does 
Right. Or, I mean, even looking at something like, you know, 300 Blackout is sort of right. the more the Western short barrel cartridge. There, there are 300 loadings that are even really well suited to home defense. Because, you right. know, a lot of people like to say that 5.56, it tumbles when it hits drywall. That's not really true. And there's lots of tests of this. There are 5.56 loadings with particular hunting rounds that will tumble easily on contact with wall. But, you know, like 190. That's the modern sport one. That's the one you want to use. 193 FMJ is designed to go through a steel helmet. It's going through your walls pretty Lynn, pretty easily. You don't know what you're talking about. That one with the orange tip on it, the horn of it, mm -hmm. there, and it'll make it a different one now. And that's, you know what I do though? I take my mag for the house right here. I got them um, alternate. I got one round of. 223, scare them off. Then I got a Horner DV Max to make a point. Then after that, I got a five six. Oh, now it might blow my gun up, but if I get to that third round, I'd rather be judged by seven than carried by twelve. You feel me? Um, home, and that's why in, in my shop gun, <laughs> my first one's a blank, and then and then the rat you rack it, and that sound will scare them off. But if it don't, the second one is the rubber shot, and then the third one is the rock salt because the rubber shot give them a blister, and the rock the rock salt will pop the blister, and it'll be all stinging. Dang. And then I got bar shot, and then I got buck shot, and for the last one. I got dragon's breath. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I just, I just got a seven tube of sabos, each with an additional grain of blue dot. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, but yeah, everyone's stupid. Don't listen to anyone, uh, and that includes us. Uh, Except for right now, listen to me when I tell you that you need to go to fflpaymentprocessing.com. If you are an FFL, if you know an FFL, or if you're in a related business, it doesn't even have to be a related business. Frankly, credit card pro processing companies are probably screwing you over. If you go to FFL Payment Solutions uh, or fflpaymentprocessing.com and you mention when you hit get rates and get in touch with them, you mention that Fudbuster sent you, they're going to set you up with free terminals. Free terminals. You're going to save money, you're going to save time, and you're never going to have to worry about like mislabeling your products to get around whatever stupid rules your bank has to in place. So go to fflpaymentprocessing.com and be sure to let them know that Fudbusters sent you. I had too much fun with that magazine one. <laughs> I saw that magazine on the, on the floor and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> Time to get a little silly. <laughs> Time to... No, I was completely serious. You see this AR-15 mag right here? It's the 10 rounds, the only 10 rounds you ain't ever going to need. Because when I was, when Grand Peppy was in the military, you only needed eight rounds of 308 in the M1 Gargrave. <laughs> the so M1 got... Gargrave. When I got 10 rounds of this here, dude, 228, I'm going to, I got a handicap because I don't have that fine United States training, but that should be enough. If eight rounds was enough in the M1 gargler, 10 rounds should do my little house. Eight, eight, rounds, rounds, in Europe. eight, eight rounds in the M1911, eight <laughs> rounds in the M1 gargler, that's all that you need. You free Europe with 16 rounds, and you sitting here telling me you need a 30 caliber clip? <laughs> In half a second? No. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> we stormed Hitler's we stormed Hitler's fortress Europe, and we only needed 16 rounds on deck. Oh, that's it. <laughs> eight in the clip and eight in the mag. You know what I mean? Yeah. Skull, yeah, brother. <laughs> uh, what do you got here? So, oh yeah, next one. So, who's going to become number twenty-eight? The next state to have permitless carry. 
Uh, let's take a look at the Louisiana Illuminator. <laughs> Pro-gun permitless carry law closer to passage in Louisiana. This is Senate Bill 1, sponsored by Senator Blake Miguez and from New Iber <laughs> Iberia, whatever, uh, would establish permitless carry in the state. And interestingly, a uh, really cool thing about this Louisiana one is that it sets the mark right at 18 years of age. So nice. <laughs> the feds would prevent you from buying a handgun from a dealer, but uh, Louisiana would happily see you uh, carrying outside the home. And I think that that is a nice gesture, Mr. Miguez from New Iberia. What do you think? That's good. Um, I, I, I know we've got, it's been a long time since we covered them. I know there is still one or two sort of higher profile, like they have opinions at the district level cases dealing with uh, 18 carry. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we get, you know, a district cir circuit, sorry, circuit level answers about these cases that apply Bruin. Cause again, if you apply Bruin faithfully, they were, giving guns to 18 years old it's like oh you're 18 and you don't have one if you didn't have one yeah here's your gun mr 18 year old yeah. where's your gun <laughs> i don't have one okay hold on <laughs> so the, you the notion for this one the notion that the founders would be okay with adults or whatever you consider your age of majority not having guns would be kind of silly yeah i think look it's okay if you want to put age limits on owning a firearm it's just that if you're going to raise the age then you have to uh supply little hamster balls for those people <laughs> 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 little hamster balls and we can make them fight <laughs> but uh but you certainly shouldn't be able to enlist them into fight uh, foreign conflicts to purportedly somehow affect our freedom that got over there <laughs> or uh, have them vote or have them do any of their other big rights because by the time you come one, you should come all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I love coming for my rights. <laughs> yeah. I love to come at all. Uh, so this is an interesting little little newsy. Uh, it's a company that is. Here's an interesting question: Has Palmer Eighty been losing significance? <laughs> Uh, let's see. I think I think they've been losing significance in some regards. I know they've been losing lawsuits in other regards, and I know they've uh, they've sort of had a fight for survival that they only narrowly survived with you know Nevada banning unfinished frames or receivers, and th they got a state court injunction against the against like an arbitrary and vagueness thing as to if polymer 80s frames are unfinished or complete frames receivers or unfinished frames or receivers which is uh an incredibly incredibly narrow thing to like hold on to your entire business by so i, I know they've also because of the federal you know, federal cases as well i know they've started doing uh, serialized frames and stuff and i think by that point their their target clientele let's say has changed shifted dramatically because the, the sort of people who wanted to have a like Gucci Glock, if you will, aren't mm -hmm. going to buy frames that come out of the mold warped, <laughs> which is just a thing with a thing with the polymer eighties, right? It just it takes a little bit of love. I'm I'm no stranger to Glocks that take a little it's bit a little of love, bit of a meat gun. right? There, there's a little bit of loving involved in getting them to be just right, and uh, I don't I just I, I don't know that people are going to be lining up to pay for that as a serialized item, but right. I I could be wrong. Anyway, uh, so yeah, they have agreed to cease sales to Maryland as part of a lawsuit settlement with the city of Baltimore, which this makes me sad. Uh, yes, yeah, this, this is tough, and it's it's yeah. painful to see just like just like all of the gun companies that New York got to roll over and give them customer data is right. It's likewise, it's tough to see because there's I I don't know if they do it because they're worried about. PR or they're worried about being cut off by financial processors because they're going to look like they're uncaring about ghost guns or something, but to I'll see these you, not even fight, it's tough. No, it's it's the money. They it's probably just a financial decision. It's, where, not, it's a tough situation where a, like a locality can sue you and $1.2 million is the, okay, we're getting off light. 
Yeah. 1.2 million dollars and you lose an entire state's worth of business is the oh, Which, by the way okay. was a big state. Yeah. Right. You no. Know? But yeah, the, the Baltimore officials said Polymer 80 falsely classified its kits as non-firearms. Um okay. And ultimately, many of their products ended up in the hands of minors and convicted felons. Much like serialized firearms do, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, then this, which is totally relevant somehow to this suit against this particular manufacturer, nine out of ten homicides in Baltimore City are committed with guns. As I promised, this city is using every tool at its disposal to address the epidemic of gun violence we face, and our comprehensive approach is finally seeing success in driving down violence. Um, this is not because they've driven down violence, they certainly haven't, uh, but because they've harassed a company and kicked it while it was down, until it could not afford to defend itself. And yeah, it just sucks. You know, this is this is something that I know we had talked about recently where I would I would imagine that you know, second to maybe hardware bans, I think the most important thing that the gun rights movement really needs to get figured out like yesterday, like a long right. time ago, is some right to acquire firearms and yeah. I, I can i can see different rationales for different ways of approaching this but you know currently there is only really one circuit that's even really touched on if people have a right to acquire guns and that you know that acquire specifically i think they were dealing with buying them and i know you then also got the azel case out of illinois where it touched on your right to and then there was a case as well from louisiana that touched on your right to get the accoutrement like can ammo and then Azel was about can they ban ranges but there really isn't a case that specifically says you have a right to buy a firearm or you have a right to make a firearm and if you ask me some of these states with self-made bans are just begging they're begging for a competent challenge that you'd ask the question does Bruin really say that you can't make a gun and then the way so, that you yeah. argue the way that you argue that is well these states put all sorts of restrictions on people's ability to buy them. People have to have a right to keep and bear arms, right? Those arms have to come from somewhere. Shouldn't they be able to make them themselves if these states are going to ban the purchase of them? And you, I mean, eventually you have, I mean, the gun rights groups need to pick one side of this wedge to drive from, and probably both, honestly, to yeah. you force courts to answer the question, where do guns come from? If you have a right to keep and bear arms, doesn't that mean that there is also a corollary right to either either buy or make, and really it should be both of them? Well, so here's the thing. You're nowhere in fundamental rights jurisprudence is it recognized that you have the right to cause somebody else to do something like for right. you, right? And I mean, you think about it in terms of like, like broader philosophical context. A right, like this is why the right to health care can't exist because it requires somebody else's labor. Right, right. like like the right to health care necessarily ends at you won't be denied your ability to have it. Right, or, or to not, try. Right, is a different it, thing. But uh, th so when it comes to guns, logically, if you're going to be consistent which nobody except us gives a shit about being consistent, <laughs> you have to recognize the right to make. You, a right to acquire cannot exist without a right to make because that is the only way to acquire without causing someone else to be involved. And right. like, if, if there's only two people left in the United States, that would mean that there was no right uh, to, to acquire, right? Because if the other didn't want to make it, that means it's just gone. Or if you're in a town with no guns, right, and no guns yeah. store, the the federal government, you 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 you're cordoned off in Alaska somewhere, and there's there's no guns, no gun store. You can't you can't get them. You have yeah. a right to keep and bear arms. Shouldn't oh, you be able to still state. make them? They recognize right. statehood for like uh, the smallest Florida key, <laughs> and, and because they the feds say you can't ship it out of state without a license. Yep. So where's your right? You know, so it's it's obvious that it has to flow. And what's funny is one of the the only circuit that's recognized a right to purchase is the, the one where this sits, where the same yes. thing that's happening sits. It was the Fourth Circuit uh, that straight up, rec like straight up said, well, obviously, right? Like obviously, you have the right to buy. <laughs> and the problem is, is you then look at all the other circuits, and it's like, fuck, this is not obvious at all. This is. 
and, and I don't I don't know I don't want to say I, like I'm going to say it's a major failing of the gun rights groups and I don't I don't necessarily major failing of the gun rights groups and here's a uh, here's why you won't see them do it because actually bringing a competent lawsuit which would not be that hard to do uh, and honestly not be it would not be insurmountable uh, it would be a challenge that would, could be done with a little bit of forward thinking uh, but there's a reason you won't see them do that. And that's because it doesn't involve uh, ball chasing, right? It doesn't involve. It's it's definitely not, not sexy, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's not, not. It's not sexy. It's, it's not it's, reactionary. You don't get to say that you're like, oh, you don't get to like use the president's name in the headline, right? Like right. It, it's and and also, I, I have. So we've talked about this behind closed doors, but. The, like there's a question that has to be asked at some point when you look at the lawsuits that are actually filed you see it's all samey shit and virtually all of it in the same circuit so it's either that right, and they always say don't never attribute to malice what can be in, in, like you know explained with incompetence right um but it's either a severe degree of incompetence a severe degree of hand kickery right with with no desire to actually move the needle or it's intentional uh, the fact that we haven't had a a right to make suit and and again with with each... and you might some of you might point to like oh uh you know vanderstock or whatever that's not a right to make suit. It, it's an apa it, it's like an apa first maybe there's a second amendment argument oh, in there so but you're standing, you're standing in the shoes of the maker of the non part right you're not standing in shoe in the shoes of the individual maker, right? It, it's yeah, it's frankly, not like it's... well, frankly, because the right to sell, we're not sure if there's a right to sell actually. And the way you assert the right to sell is by representing the interests of your customers, right? And that's how it's that's how I got away with it. That's how it's been get, gotten away with in a lot of lawsuits is by saying. I don't have to assert a right to sell. I am standing in the shoes of my customers to, who have a, a constitutionally concomitant right to buy them. And so my right to sell them exists in parity with that, right? You're, it, it's, so it's super, it's super interesting the way that's done. But to do the right to make suit, you have to, you have to go to, I'll tell you, okay, I, I want to do it in Puerto Rico. <laughs> that's where i want to do it <laughs> that's where i want to do it but uh but anyway that's that's a lot of of bloviating to say that it's very sad to see paul Moretti get bullied like this yes. um in a place that you know should be losing harder right and you know the the fact that this bullying has happened can happen and continues to happen i don't want to say at this point that it's a choice but <laughs> it gets closer and closer to the gun rights groups making it a choice when God, the, every state you see add a new you know like self-made ban some of these self-made bans go beyond just you can't have a gun without a serial number it's like straight up you cannot use these tools to make a gun you can't use those right. dev tools to make a gun if you make a gun you have to make all of these parts yourself uh i i, I think that it's just right it's just asking it's asking for a constitutional challenge on the grounds of like at what point is it just illegal to have a gun because you can't get one right if you don't right. know a guy like you i think what you need to find one of these groups need to find is a state that has your know, third-party sales bans so it's, it's got universal backgrounds checks right it's got some sort of a hardware ban that makes it so there are certain kinds of guns you just can't get you know, like, especially if it's one that doesn't have a grandfather clause, so that's, that'd be another part of your Goldilocks state. And then they have a self-made ban because that's going to completely shutter off a wide swath of firearms that you can make a Second Amendment argument or important necessary for self-defense. You can import a lot of California's handgun roster arguments where it's like there is new stuff that you're preventing us from having that is very important and we should be able to have. Right. And then import the, like, you've got a Second Amendment right to keep them their arms those have to come from somewhere and right. todd Vandermine in illinois with his with his group which is ffl illinois he's raised some interesting uh, questions about 
parts bans. He specifically done it under the context of assault weapons bans that ban parts. But he's also sort of incorporated that language, interestingly, under self-made bans, where he's like, well, if you're going to ban self-making, at some rate, you're banning the necessary functions of repairing a firearm. Hmm. You're going to ban repairing a firearm. That means that you've just banned them all by attrition, because eventually... Like like you know, frames or receivers are regulated. And we like to think of those as the core of the gun, and each one is a right. gun. What happens if a frame or receiver breaks? You should just be able to make another one, right? You should just be able to like three D print or mill or weld or stamp or whatever a new one. Because receivers do break. They are wear items on not not. I wouldn't say wear items on some guns, but they are. Oh, they are they're somewhere there. there. There are items that wear out, right? I would and, say on a on a Beretta ninety two. Uh, right. The receiver is definitely a wear item <laughs> on a Tech Nine, but that's an accident. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, some guns have receivers even that are wear items, and if you're going to require that someone has an FFL to be able to fix their own gun, that's kind of ridiculous because you own it, you've passed yes, all of the checks really? to own it. <laughs> and in the case of Illinois, right, you've got a little card that says that I pass a background check every day at the end of the day, I should be able to own this. It's right. kind of ridiculous that then they're saying you couldn't make a new one of the exact same thing to replace it if it had broken. So right. again, there's all of these lawsuits I think are just begging to be brought. And I think it is, I, I in my opinion... I think the foundation of the right to buy is built out of the right to build. Once you have a solid cornerstone that says, look, you can build a gun. This is how you acquire firearms. I think from there, you can expand that to you also then have a right to buy firearms for if someone made it and doesn't want it anymore or somebody's trying right. to. Because, you know, of course, the problem with with buying firearms do you necessarily invoke commerce in at the state and federal and county and at every level, right? They all have their own version of the commerce clause that lets them put barriers in the way of buying and selling like, like background checks, which the Supreme court seems to think are great and fine and okay. Despite the fact that there's, <laughs> they're wildly inconsistent with Bruin, but they're like, yeah, they can stay. Cause, cause I guess at the end of the day, they're going to say that the commerce clause is controlling there. Right. And, and that, you know, that the second amendment, has to be okay with the commerce clause because they were like coexist coextant right yeah but that was not when you uh that was back when the commerce clause was understood <laughs> hey don't tax each other states okay right <laughs> and, and then you know you know really that's just another angle for these lawsuits where uh california illinois washington uh all have language in their laws that says you can't import from another state these parts so right. like they're they're banning your ability to exercise your rights as compared to another state by question of import as those state borders or something they get to patrol and uh yeah, we, yeah no and that's that's and, the and reason we of, have a federal government is to prevent the states from saying oh your rights are different here we have a border you can't you can't come here with those ideas you can't come here with those those things you can't do your rights like that here yeah i know that well, yeah, that's a, an interesting 14th Amendment result, but that's the result that we have. Um, but the Commerce Clause was just never meant. It was It's so obviously never meant yes. to touch that. And I mean, one of the main reasons for the Commerce Clause was because under the Articles of Confederation, which was the version of a, of a federal government that we had before the Constitution, the first thing states were doing was like, taxing each other, like, you know, putting tariffs on each other's borders and shit. And they're obviously, they're like, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, do not do that. Um, and now, how is it not a dormant commerce clause violation to say something that we recognize is the, <laughs> you have a right to do. You cannot import from another state. That's a, like, maniac level dormant commerce right. clause You can't violation. import it from another state, and then in some of these states, then you can't make it here. Yeah. <laughs> And also this thing shall, this thing is subject to an order of shall not be infringed that the states are bound to as well. Yeah. And just so for you guys out there that aren't like law nerds, the Commerce Clause is, I mean, I feel like most of our listeners know what the Commerce Clause is, but that's a, every action of government has to have a source of power in the Constitution in order to be legitimate. And that's on the state and and uh, federal level too. Like it, the, all powers have to be traced back to uh, a sort a legitimate source of power. The federal government, the powers are few and and, and defined. In the in the New <laughs> Deal era, they decided to just tweak the Commerce Clause a little bit because uh, a certain president, FDR, 
threatened to pack the Supreme Court if they didn't effectively. So they started saying, well, the Commerce Clause actually means kind of you can do whatever you want. Yeah, like the uh, Commerce Clause seems... was like, Previously, the Commerce Clause was understood to like allow the federal government to like make sure that we had regular trade between states and with the Indian tribes, you know, kind of like it says. Right, interstate uh, commerce. Yeah. Um, and so the theory then of the dormant Commerce Clause had to come about because the Commerce Clause got so fucked up that states started doing the exact thing they weren't supposed to do. And so they were like, oh, well, if you look, like, really look underneath the Commerce Clause, like there's a dormant Commerce Clause which says that states can't regulate activity of another state or and can't discriminate against, you know, out of state conduct economically. It, and it's like, no, that's just the Commerce Clause. Like that's just that's literally just what I mean. But, that's what the Commerce Clause actually originally meant. Yeah, and so that's there's a little a tiny con law micro lecture for you guys. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how fucked up our constitutional jurisprudence is. Is that the obvious and stated purpose of a source of government power was understood to do that for almost two hundred years, uh, and then FDR wanted to wanted to pass more bread and you know bread house garage. Uh, and so then when states started doing the exact opposite, judges had to be like, wait, I've discovered something hidden in the document. <laughs> <laughs> the Commerce Clause means affecting interstate commerce, but things that don't affect interstate commerce do affect interstate commerce because otherwise they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, then you could, and then you didn't want it. <laughs> that's, that's, that was the actual, uh, dear listeners, logic underlying the uh, Gonzalez v. Reich decision concerning growing your own uh, hemp or whatever it was. And here, here's here's another fun little law tidbit. That decision is what stopped us, is, is, what, what effectively is the controlling jurisprudence for the, you know, the made in Texas suppressors or the made in whatever suppressors because there was a case out of California dealing with machine guns where a guy had made a bunch of stins in California never bothered to register them and his argument and he succeeded at the ninth circuit mind you succeeded at the ninth circuit with the argument i made these in this state they never affected interstate commerce what the fuck's the problem and the ninth circuit was like yeah we agree this doesn't this isn't this Fed, federal power act has no bearing here you don't have to register it if you made it in the state and then uh very you know funnily enough paul clement who was then solicitor general of the united states who's now i mean he was the gun rights lawyer who got us the Bruin victory but then he was working for the government and the you know, he, he, arguing arguing for the government against this guy and his machine guns but the supreme court uh, gvr'd this case because of the hemp case which essentially said commerce clause means that even if it stays in one state we still have control over it because if it wasn't just in you know even if it wasn't that one state Right. If it wasn't for you having it that in state, you'd have to get it from another state, which means it is interstate commerce, which, <laughs> is, a, which is a bizarre reading. But that's you know, ever since FDR, that's sort of the way the Commerce Clause works is it's interstate commerce and not interstate commerce. Yeah. But that case was considered the high water mark of Commerce Clause jurisprudence. And they have clawed it back ever so slightly since then. Uh, in fact, the first time that the Commerce Clause was clawed back after that case was for the Federal Gun Free School Zones Act. <laughs> um, it, which is fascinating, right? Because it was just like you can't go in a school zone with a uh, firearm, uh, and so that got shot down because it had no hook in the commerce clause. And so, what did they do? They fixed it by saying a firearm that has affected interstate commerce. Yep. Which, according to the federal government, is every fire. Oh, <laughs> but anyway, it's all of them. Let's move on to map corporation guys it's maf corporation that's maf-arms.com where if you use promotional code fud busters you can get a good discount you got to check out the site there's always cool stuff available for sale to be purchased online with credit uh token chips so yeah be sure to go to mafarms.com check out the selection of wind chime kits and use code fud busters all right next up I, I can't believe I lived in the state for two years. Virginia, or was it three years? I don't remember. I lived in Virginia for a while, and now there's a bunch 
of, uh, of gun reform bills headed to the governor's desk. Now look, these measures will make the Commonwealth safer, but ignorant, misinformed gun fetishists say these bills only make it harder to own a gun. So, <laughs> <laughs> what do we got? Uh, Senate Bill 99 prohibits the carrying of certain semi-automatic center fire rifles and shotguns anywhere that is open to the public, with certain exceptions. Uh, this bill is been referred to as just common sense. Uh, there's so no basically for, oh, an open carry ban of certain firearms. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a like carry gun ban. Right. So Senator Angela Williams Graves says there's no reason for folks to be, you know, having these kinds of high powered weapons. Brilliantly stated. <laughs> Does the law mention the power of a firearm even a single time? No. Interesting. Well, center fire, right? Center fire means powerful, right? I guess I guess like you can't have the, rim, the, the rim ones is is the, the, the rim ones they Wait, hold on. Isn't it the rim ones that bounce around in your skull? Yeah, the rim ones bounce around in your skull. They're more deadly than a 50 cal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senate Bill 368 would have owners store firearms and the ammunition for such firearms in a locked container, compartment, or cabinet that is inacceptable, inaccessible to minors or prohibited people if those people are likely to be around the home. So... What this bill, this common sense gun reform bill means is that if you have children, you lose the right to protect them. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, as a, it's a good thing I don't live in Virginia and don't have kids around because I'd be going to jail. Because <laughs> I, I guarantee you I don't know where all of the loose rounds are. So can you, can you, like, like, by the time you're like, like, you've gone past gun owner and you're like certified gun freak. Yeah. Gun extreme gun fetishist, I think, was the, was the term. Yeah. Uh, like I got a, I got a couple four tens, a couple of eight Mausers just floating around on the desk. Like, it, it yeah, like this mag was, I just discovered this PSL magazine sitting on my desk, and I'm a little happy because PSL mags are expensive, and now I have one. And of course, when when kids are around, I'm not I'm not saying safe storage is a bad idea. But the way that safe storage laws necessarily work is it treats it you know it it treats everyone, including the well-meaning people who have taught their kids to be safe around guns, as though they're you know like everybody gets treated like the lowest common denominator. Like you assume every kid is troubled Timmy who likes to put the revolver barrel in his mouth <laughs> for taste test. I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this one looks like a little chocolate. Yeah, maybe it tastes that way. <laughs> and so, you know, these, these sorts of laws, and, and I guess I've also seen criticism of them that the only time these laws actually ever get used is after something tragic happens, like something you know, tragic. You know, the, 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 you know, these, these parents have just had the worst day of their lives, and then the cops show up to say, "Hey, you're arrested." Well, the, yeah, the, the majority of times that I've seen these used in practice was. Uh, they call they get called for domestics. And usually, you know, a lot of times, heated argument, whatever, a neighbor calls, everything's cooling down. The cops come, hey, we need to come in. We got a call here for a domestic. They they come in, they're like, Hey, you own a gun. <laughs> and then they arrest them. Like, that's so good for a family. Isn't it just ripping people away from them? Yeah, that's, that's so good for them. That's the desired outcome. That is the desired outcome because we have to make sure. Now, look, I'm not a person who thinks that, like, you know, this this idea that the like the, oh, the nuclear family is under attack because I believe in extended families, but I, I will say that they are definitely trying to rip homes apart, and with with shit like this, like. When you when you pass the law and you include the mechanism of, of enforcement, it, it you don't have to have a super galaxy brain to know how it gets it goes down. And so when you go through with it, knowing that's how it's going to happen, I find it hard to absolve you of the fact that you are literally just ripping families apart. Yeah. 
that is all you can possibly be doing. So you must be doing it on purpose. Uh, but then again, I am a uh, you know conspiracy theorist. Uh, I've been called a uh, racist for my beliefs. So I must be some just some kind of moron. After all, uh, Virginia's gun laws are already among the toughest in the nation, and Governor Youngkin continues to pursue policies to hold criminals that commit crimes with guns accountable by strengthening penalties to effectively keep criminals off the streets and Virginians safe. The governor will review any legislation that comes to his desk. Okay. That's wonderful. What flavor of government lizard is Youngkin? I don't remember. I thought I thought he was a Republican. I know at one point Virginia had a Republican governor. Uh, Republican Party. Oh, look at this man. Look at his little face. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely suns himself on a rock. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is big news, guys. Big news. Uh, big news, Supreme Court on fire, NFA is over, they've lost their ability to... Uh, Senator Portatino introduces bill requiring annual registration of firearms. This is a California uh, bill, SB 1160, will give the state better data and help us understand how many firearms are in private hands and who owns them. Currently, we only have rough estimates on how many firearms are in California. This important step toward registration will also increase accountability and responsible gun ownership as we collectively endeavor to increase public safety. So what this bill would do is require every firearm in the state to be every year annually registered with the Department of Justice. Uh, an annual fee would be deposited into a special fund for the purpose of carrying out the administration and enforcement of the registry. Uh, and it would require the California DOJ to establish and maintain a system for the annual registration uh, and make it available to other law enforcement agencies. Uh, it also requires that reasonable efforts be made to notify firearms dealers, owners, and the public about registration requirements. Registration is one of those interesting ones where it, it's understandable I guess you know at, at very, understandable. At very face value, it's understandable yeah. how people think that all guns are registered. Like most yeah. people think that guns are just all registered because that's what the background check is for, right? Right? And that it's understandable then at, at second blush how people would think that it actually works. <laughs> but if you're ever talking to a person who thinks that registration is like, oh, it's good, it would stop all crime because every we all we know who owns guns and what what guns they own, and all guns are accounted for. The thing that you have to do with them is like a simple rhetorical test where you ask them, oh, so so you think, <laughs> is this mass gun registry? Yeah. <laughs> it's my gun registry. You send me, you send me $15, I'll register your gun for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the test that you have to do with these people is, you know, in, in three parts. So you, you first ask them. So you think a registry will work, right? Like a you know, registry, you, you make sure everybody knows about every kind of gun, right? And yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what a registry would do. And so you'd say, so you'd have no, you second part, you know, you have no problem with the type of gun people own, right? They could, they could own a rocket launcher, right? It's registered. They yeah, can own right. you know, machine guns. They, they could own like fully automatic rocket launching machine guns that <laughs> launch that launch micro launch pistols. Smaller rocket launchers. That have, that have stocks on them, a short, short barrel <laughs> pistol rocket stock pistol, yeah. fully automatic <laughs> launcher. Yeah. And then, then immediately, of course, they'll be like, oh, no, well, not all kinds of guns and then you say well why right there yeah, why you know don't, 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 it's good. Don't, don't, you think, don't you think registration works and then their answer is no and so you that, that leaves you with two assumptions that are possible right two rational assumptions left this either a it's not a serious person they don't they, they, they can't think right they're incapable of thought is is one option and the other thought is they're quite capable of thinking and their thought is i want to make owning guns as difficult as possible yeah and that's it. <laughs> it's I it's don't not want to prevent crime. I want to ban guns. Right. It's it's not a question of them you know, trying to make people safer or anything. They just they just want the guns gone. No more guns, like Gabby Gifford says. Yeah. And so no, it's it's a and you know I've said this a thousand times, but it is a. I truly believe that people who 
behave this way. Behave in this fashion. Do it because they are like uncomfortable personally with the responsibility of owning a firearm. Yes, I, I agree. And yeah. the and the more of these questions, and, and this is something that I picked up from our, our Greek lawyer friend uh, Kostas Moros, who if Costas, you're listening, hang out with us again. You, you have to come back in the Discord. You have to hang out. No, with we didn't mean to scare you. That <laughs> We're only like that fifty percent of the time, not all the time. <laughs> But uh, you know, it's a it's a thing that I saw him doing where instead of you know, it is it is of course fun to meet anti gunners who are being ignorant with calling them ignorant and all sorts of other funny names. Yeah. It's very fun. But he's got this strategy where he'll he'll just ask them a question. So to, they'll say something like, "Well, oh, I I, I want to ban all of the the weapons that are designed for killing, but you can you can have the guns that aren't designed for killing." So you ask them like, "Can you name a couple of guns that?" weren't designed for killing people that you think would be good for self-defense or you know people saying that you know the inverse of that is people saying ar-15s are no good for hunting ask them can you list like what's your recommendation for hunting guns and you okay. invariably, invariably they'll be like a handgun a nine mil and you'll be like eh? like yeah. <laughs> and, <hard>. so, <laughs> and so you know asking questions of these people sort of teases out these answers and so eventually there'll be somebody saying like oh no one can be trusted with a kind of weapon like that and if you if you get them to engage with you by asking questions in a civil manner very often you'll find people who like the people that are just completely opposed to any any sort of gun ownership whatsoever if you get them to start talking about why it will come down to some version of they either don't trust themselves with the guns because they think that they would get mad and do something evil with them or mm -hmm. someone very close to them they just you, they, they, that you, that person is so close to them and they understand that person is so unstable that they wouldn't get that person help but if that person had a gun they wouldn't be happy with it and so it it, it, it just you know, it comes down to a thing where their own personal anecdotes drive their own interpretation of the world and of course the flip side of this is true right where you'll, you'll run into people where their lives have been saved with a gun and these are the sorts of people that like you know, there is it's worse than no compromise right it's like the people that you know, signs will say you can't carry a gun in the school and they're like i do not care right <laughs> and i'm, I'm sure like maybe, i know what happens maybe you know a person like this maybe you don't or you're people who have been carjacked or attacked and from that point on right it doesn't matter if it's legal doesn't matter if they have a permit doesn't matter if you know, whatever they're going to carry a gun with them in their car and if anybody gives them trouble about it <laughs> that's that's now an issue between them and you know, we'll see how that goes from there but but you know it's this it's the sort of strong emotional anecdotal response drives a lot of things mm -hmm. but i think i guess if you ask me right this is this, this is my own personal bias just and i'm confirming it i think that it's more rational for somebody who's been in a situation where they either needed a gun or had the gun and it saved them to be like yes i need this than it is for somebody who's like i would kill people if i had a gun Therefore, nobody should have one. <laughs> I, I think I think the fact that you should be on medication that makes the makes the demons that make you want to kill people to go away, you should be on those pills. I, I think the fact that that's the way you those pills. I think the fact that that's the way you see the world is uh, irrational and shouldn't be the basis for from which everyone else's rights get interpreted. <laughs> because you have demon shadow people that say that that guy's <laughs> looking at you, he's staring at you, you need to, you need to stop him. <laughs> he's, he's from the government and he's got a mind control frequency emitter that's telling you all of these things. <laughs> but if you stop him, then the shadow people will go away and you can sleep at night. You telling me if I pull this trigger... All the bad people will go away. <laughs> All I have to do is pull this right here. <laughs> That's right, young one. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, that's good. You know what else is good? Patriot Patch Company, guys. It's patriotpatch.co. They are our longest running supporter, so you should support them. Custom design patches, apparel, and accessories for any freedom loving individual. Always go out. Check out the Claret section. They're always updating it. You might have something new and interesting there. And of course, if you use our promotional code TWIG10, that's T-W-I-G-10, you will get a discount. And that is an important uh, a thing to reminder to you because you are a, uh, you know, rational consumer. Let's see what the Patch of the Month Club is right now. <laughs> oh, look. All luck, no skill. <laughs> it's a leprechaun on a skateboard that says all luck, all luck, no skill, and he's holding two MP5s. And he has nods. Oh, yeah, he has actually. NVGs, yeah. That's pretty big. 
So yeah, patriotpatch.co. Check them out. <laughs> All right, and last up, we have we have a big law case. Uh, this is a. I love the way that how how carked up this is because it's all of these cases. <laughs> it's all so yes. Yeah. So what's so going is, on here? This is back on our on our Illinois stuff. So if, if you guys remember last time, of course, there's all of the cases that have appealed an emergency stat stature to the Supreme Court, and that's where most of these are. But back in the uh, district court, uh, the the judge there is very anxious to get to this case on the merits. So he sort of laid out a. Uh, this is what I want to see from these cases on the merits. And it's, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people saw this and at first blush, they were like, oh, oh my goodness, he's trying to bring back interest balancing, but he was supposed to be a pro-gun judge. Uh, what the heck is he doing? What, what on earth? What and the so heck he, are he had a list of like a 12 or if you pull it back up, it, it's close to the bottom of the document. He has a list of the sort of questions that he's interested in fleshing out uh, through through the discovery process, through, 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 through the uh, getting factual answers. So we can just sort of go through them. And yeah. then once once we go through them, and I want, I want the audience, I'm sure the audience wastes all of their time and wake hours reading legal briefs because that's what normal people yeah, do. Because they're just but like if, us. If you remember the Seventh Circuit opinion, Keep that in mind as you go through these questions, and I think you'll be able to catch on to the game that's being played here. Mm -hmm. So I guess for the audio listeners, I will have to read them out. Uh, number one, the first question they want to answer also, is... Hey, uh, the, this is important, uh, the, the context, right? The court... No I'll read that out. The court notes that the Seventh Circuit in Beavis treated semi-automatic rifles as a category in referring to the AR-15 and its many cousins covered by this act. In light of this, the court will treat evidence relevant to any of the banned firearms as relevant to the class or category of firearms to which that weapon belongs. Additionally, the court will also consider any evidence relevant to a class or category of firearms to be relevant to any individual firearm in that class or category of firearms. The factual questions the court will address include, now you can go ahead. Is the item an arm as defined in Heller and Bruin? <laughs> which is uh, sort, sort of a sneaky trick question there because yeah. the, the answer is yes no matter what there. With, with right. Bruin, it's, 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 it's presumptively an arm until the... Right. Or, or, the, the, the Second Amendment presumptively protects uh, weapons of offense and armor for defense. Uh, the second, second question is, is the item an arm as defined in Bevis? <laughs> and the answer is going to be no. And hopefully you guys see the first trap here. <laughs> Is that he's going to get the state to admit. <laughs> of course, the state's going to say it's no and no. But right. of course, the, you know, the, 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 the fact that they're going to elicit is going to let him write an opinion that says the answer is yes, it's an arm <laughs> as defined in Heller and Bruin. And no, it's not as defined in Bevis. Mm -hmm. How can we possibly score this difference of opinion? <laughs> so he's he, you know, there, there's there's his attempt... And I think it's a pretty clear attempt, really, to undermine what they had said in Bevis, because they had they had invented a new definition for how you tell if something's an arm, right? And so, further, the new question three is further undermining the Bevis opinion. Uh, three is: Is there a rational basis for a civilian to select a particular arm for use in self-defense in the home? And so he's going to be soliciting information. He's going to want the question of, is there a rational basis for a civilian to protect, you know, select whatever it is that they're debating? So AR-15s, AKs, extended magazines, yeah. clips uh, for use in self-defense in the home. Which, of course, right, th th this, is like, this is like a one-step test. You know, he, yeah. he, he, he's boiled it down to like, oh, do you need an AR-15? Instead, he's asking, is there a rational basis for you to have one? So... If and so remember, like, guys, rational basis in the legal context is it's a term of art. And what that means is, is there anything right. that could be like, and it doesn't have to be a good reason. It means, is there any conceivable reason, right, that is not clown shoes nut job, like alien invasion level stupid. So... He, what he wants, the, he's forcing them to struggle, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter if they say yes or no, because either way, they're hanging themselves. <laughs> yep. And then that's funny, because yeah, it starts, is there a rational basis for them to select that arm 
for self-defense in the home. And then four, uh, it's the same question, but it's self-defense outside the home. But then five, five is, <laughs> is there a rational basis for a civilian to select a particular item for use in self-defense to repel a riot or large scale attack? <laughs> so you can tell you can you can <laughs> you can tell he's he's a he's really undermining the position where the state you because of course you know, with that fifth question you can certainly tell he's you know poking in the direction of high capacity magazines or large capacity magazines as the state defines them that there, there are instances where you might need more than ten rounds, and even you, even if that's entirely prospective, right? It's not something that's ever happened. He's asking a rational basis, right? The rational basis is, uh, what if there's eleven guys? <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty impressive if you hit one of them, or two of them with one bullet, right? Get, hitting, right. hitting a collateral clip in real life would be pretty sick, but uh, <laughs> it's also, it's also relatively unlikely. So. That's certainly a good, I guess, on to, on to question six, he asks, is the item an arm that may be used to resist tyranny? <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to think he's our guy. <laughs> and so, you know, pe people saw those rational basis questions. They were like, is this interest balancing? And uh, you know, at first blush, it definitely seems like it. But he's yeah, using the, right he's, the he's using the language of the Seventh Circuit, but flipping it around so right. that you know, they're they're instead of like is this a rational choice it's like can you come up with a rational reason because that's i mean heller tells you that's all you should need as let's see so question seven is the item exclusively or predominantly useful in a military or law enforcement setting and i thought so, so that's it that is as if they select yes to any of the other ones then it's like well hold on <laughs> <laughs> so you know seven seven is interesting and uh, exclusively or predominantly is is I mean, it's two different words there. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't think I don't think any small arms are exclusively useful to the military. Like maybe surface to air. Like light, by the time you get to light weapons, maybe there are some light weapons that like you, you it would have to be pretty ridiculous that a civilian is in a situation. Yeah, like it's, it's more, there's it's some more light weapons system that are that you could very easily see are predominantly useful in a military right. application. But oh. anything that's small arms, like yeah. I would, I would say in full auto MP5 and M249, I would say that there is a use for it that isn't just predominantly military or law enforcement. I'd say that there's a legitimate use case for a civilian to have such a thing. Maybe right. it's maybe it's purely perspective, but maybe not. And then on to question eight: Is the item specifically designated by the U.S. By, by the U.S. military as a weapon to be acquired by the U.S. military and issued to his troops. And so he's here pulling at the string that yeah. you know, the, the Seventh Circuit was saying that the, the M16 and the AR-15 is the same. And look, I'm a big retard about the fact that the M16 is an AR-15. Yeah. But what he's specifically getting at here is he's going to point out how the swath of semi-automatic weapons banned by this, with very, very few exceptions, right? Because the U.S. military does actually use some semi-auto long guns. Right. Like the M110 or the M14 DMR variants that they've taken full auto out of. But, mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I, but essentially what he's getting at here is he's trying to get the, you're trying to get the facts on the table that say that the guns that are being banned here aren't weapons of war insofar as the court is going to be concerned about making that determination. Right. Now, if you, if you ask me, I, I mean, in fact, we've even seen in Ukraine, right? He, he specifies U.S. military, but Ukrainian special forces have taken, in, in some instances, right, r relatively high profile, like there's GoPro camera of them using them, semi-auto ARs in instances where they could be using full auto AKs. Make of that what you will, but it seems like there's conscious choices being made there as far as what isn't isn't the best weapon of war choice, at least for what they're doing. Because, of course, they're, they're not putting night vision on the things. So. Right. You know, night, night vision and having a laser is more important than select fire. And I think anybody who would disagree with that in a fighting context either hasn't used one of the I well, hasn't used one of the two or haven't hasn't used one of the two enough. Because mm -hmm. being able to see in the dark and then shoot in the dark is much more important than being able to miss quickly. 
Uh, and then question nine, does the item meet all of the specifications required by the U.S. military to qualify for issue as a rifle or pistol to be deployed with United States troops? Essentially, what he's asking, what he's going to get them to admit here is that uh, that doesn't have select fire for the right. for the intermediate caliber stuff. Uh, Ten, is the weapon materially different than an M16, M4, or machine gun? I really hate how he used materially different right. because if you're asking materially different in terms of how the gun works or how it's constructed, I don't really think it's materially different, except in the most strict sense of like materially, like it's got different materials in it or it would <laughs> require material alteration to make one into the other. Like, yes, that's the case. And certainly legally speaking, they're materially different. But if you had the two of them side by side, and the you know the pinhole the auto sear pinhole was taped I don't up. You say that they're legally materially different. They shouldn't be, but you yeah. uh, under understanding federal definition anyway. Under uh, under right. what we can I guess we can agree is legal fiction. <laughs> <laughs> they are different. Right. Uh, question eleven is the firing rate of semi-automatic weapons banned by the law materially different than the firing rate of M16, M4, and fully automatic machine guns? And so. Uh, Again, I don't. I'm you know, the, the questions ten and eleven here. I'm not a big fan of the way they've been worded because the firing rate of semi-automatic yeah, no, weapons. This is, so here's where he's delving more into like you know this is 2008 pro gun, uh, you know thinking, right? Uh, which whatever you know it's it's NRA boomer con stuff. It, 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 he can only be so good. All right. It's it's just sort of this like oh it's one pull of the trigger but meanwhile the cyclic rates are the same the effective rates of fire are different it would be much more clear if he had said effective rate of fire right or is this not not even sustain or sustained isn't even the right word effective rate of fire is the correct term yeah uh, question twelve is the item a dual use arm that may be used in both military and civilian settings now the reason he asks this is because there is precedent that says that. If it's a dual use arm that has use in both, the thing that, that a finger should be placed on the scale of the Second Amendment. So if it's dual use, it should be tipped in favor of it's protected by the Second Amendment, is essentially what he's trying to get at there. And I imagine sort of the uh sort of the play there is if he can get the state to admit that it's dual use, you then he'll be able to you you know, go from there and say that well the Seventh Circuit erred in their analysis because they didn't consider if this was a dual use arm because if it's dual use then you know, presumptively yeah. it's got a legal civilian application. Mm -hmm. uh, and question thirteen is the item principally possessed and used for unlawful purposes? <laughs> Genius level question. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a really great question because and this is something Mr. Mark Smith Four Boxes Diner talks about that. The, the the easiest way to deal with the hardware ban, if if it you know, if it came if it came to a narrow decision from the Supreme Court, the easy for, way for them to make that decision is you said handguns were protected. If you're if public safety is the one thing hanging you up, the handguns that you said are protected are used uh, dramatically more often than the long guns that are before you. Right. And so I think that's a very a very sharp question in thirteen because uh, the district court very specifically pointed out the common handgun is protected per Heller. So mm -hmm. that's a that's a very sharp question for him to seek information on. A 14 is the item in common use. <laughs> and th th you know, th this is one where there's yeah. been there's been briefed you you've briefed on the merits determinations of what common use means. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't mean anything. And before anybody rushes to the comments to say, but Caetano said it means this. Caetano didn't yeah. say shit. Yeah. Alito's concurrence in Caetano said that maybe there's a number, and Thomas may have signed on to that concurrence, but it is just a concurrence, and it's dicta in concurrence, so it doesn't actually mean anything. It's, cer it's certainly an insight. It's a useful argument to make, but that doesn't mean that that's a test and or that's what it is. You know, because certainly if, if it is just a, you know, personally, I think just the number threshold would actually not be great for us because right. that would, you know, th that would let them ban all sorts of new, new things. Right. Yeah, no, we, we, we've talked about this in the Discord. Um, which you guys can join if you give me money and we'll bully you. But <laughs> we've, we've aired our frustration about how people like just cling on this common use idea and, and fling it around as if it's such good gospel. Right. Uh, it's, it's not the only way that a gun's protected. It, it, it's, it's a dispositive way to show that something isn't dangerous and unusual. Right. And, but like, and also dangerous and unusual isn't a test. These are all sub factors, right. right? That you, that, 
you know, the, the gun rights community is errantly uh, clinging to, and, and, and it's not helpful. Because uh, if you do go with the common use thing, if common use, it winds up being the, you know, the last uh, word. That means no new guns. Right. <laughs> that's, that's what that effectively means. That they, they, they could, they, I mean, California can go and prospectively ban all sorts of new stuff. Like, well, we're going to ban handguns that ship with a factory magazine capacity over twenty-one rounds. Right. Because eventually, we'll be there. Right. Eventually, we'll you know, eventually cartridge technology will advance to the point that we're all shooting each other with twenty-two TCM. Well, or or eventually somebody will will actually use uh, thirty super carry for its logical use case, which is right twenty-something rounds in a Glock nineteen size package. But, right. And so that's that's sort of the you know, the fall through. Like, you know, common common use isn't the only way that something's protected. And in fact, Bruin sort of clarified that where something's protected presumptively, right? The yeah. the state then has the burden of finding an, an analog, and that's what the dangerous and unusual thing was. Was there like weirdly in Heller, they went out of their way to say like this is what a potential analog would look like. And that's where the dangerous and unusual thing came from. And right. then they then they sort of offered up, oh, but the fact that these handguns are in common use would mean that dangerous and unusual couldn't be the analog because they are in common use. Right. So they like went and like in a very confusing manner, admittedly, laid out like how this would actually work. And then I and then of course a lot of people got especially in the days of interest balancing, a lot of pro gun argument got tied up in saying, oh, but it's in common use. Right. Well, that's you, yeah. you don't you don't have to prove it's in common use even. Yeah. That's sort of just it's a dispositive thing and it's not yeah, it's not all of the argument. <laughs> I'm trying to help. But, and so as cool as cool as it would be that oh but there's two hundred thousand machine guns, does that mean right. they're legal? And no. No, I mean it, at least not on that factor alone. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, Br Bruin would tell you they're presumptively legal and the state has to find analogs. And right. hopefully one day, inshallah, we ha shall have answers on that. But Yes. Yes. But anyway, so that's, that's pretty slick. I, I am excited to see how this one plays out. Uh, but anyway, I think that is all we've got for you guys today. Yep, uh, depending on when this goes up, Vanderstock, or not Vanderstock, uh, Cargill v. Garland, the bump stock ban, our oral arguments at Supreme Court are on February 28th. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have to either listen to that or have listened to that, and we'll talk about it next time. Wow. Yeah, wow. The future. The future is cool. But, yeah, guys, so we've, we've uploaded our first of the new series of FUD, Buster, uh, FUD Blasters on the FUD Blasters YouTube channel. Um, that was actually one we had recorded the last time, and it was uh, stuck around. So you will see a market production value improvement on the next episode. Uh, but be sure to go and subscribe to FUD Blasters on YouTube, and uh, and I think you guys will like what we have in store. Anyway, that's it for the moment. We will see you next time.